Jakobs grundades 2001 av Sara Mohammad. Idag gavs arbetsgrupper i åtta städer runt om i landet. Verksamheten byggs på tre delare. Dels stödverksamhet, fler utsatta. Här är flera av de med stödkoren viktig. Den invigdes i söndags av Anders Irgeman på Galan i Bärs. Den har fått stöd delvis av socialtjänstförvaltningen i Stockholms stad. Den andra delaren är utbildningsinsatser i förbyggande syfte. Så som föreläsningar i skolor och på arbetsplatser. Och det tredje är opinionsbildande aktiviteter, vilket studielagarna är en del av. Kraft har stöttat minst 500 ungdomar per år med möten, chattstöd, telefonsamtal, juridisk rådgivning, psykologiska stödsamtal och expertis helt kostnadsfritt. Arbetet är helt ideellt bortsett från en heltidsanställd och det är Sara. Vi har tre internationella gäster med oss idag som har åkt långt för att komma hit och dela oss sin kunskap. De har stor erfarenhet av det här ämnet och är experter på området. It's a great honor to have the three of you here today. Jag kommer lämna över till Sara Larsson, skribent, redaktör, moderator och Goodwill ambassadör för GAP under 2015. Uh, yes, just as Camilla said, we are lucky to have here today with us at this conference three very prominent international experts who have come to share some of their vast knowledge, experience and insight into these issues and to speak of the need for specific strategies to address honor-based violence. Now, our first speaker has dedicated her life to campaigning for, human, for universal human rights. She is a former Kurdish freedom fighter and refugee, now living in Britain. She is the founder and executive director of the Iranian and Kurdish women's rights organization, providing advice, advocacy and counseling to women affected by honor-based violence. Her efforts have contributed to the criminalization of forced marriage in the UK in 2014. Her work has received international recognition and she is often called upon to share her expertise with government, academics and the media. So it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce to you Diana Nami. Please welcome. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here again this year to uh, remembering uh, Fatima and Pella and all other victims of honor-based violence around the world. It is my privilege to be here with you and great honor to feel that I am part of a movement, not only in Europe, but internationally around the world. Uh, let me just talk about uh, our uh, organization. I don't know the PowerPoint is not on, but anyway, yeah. When I came to the UK in 1996, I have been provided an interpreter. Her name was Sophia. She came with us a few times to enroll my daughter in her primary school. For the third occasion, she never turned up. When I went home, I called her office and asked about her. They told me that she's dead. The only thing I could imagine at that time was a road accident in London. But the office told me that she was taken back to Iran, Iraq, and she was killed by her, her partner and in-laws because he suspected that she is flirting with one of her colleagues. I called police with the help of one of my friends. And police reaction shocked me more than her death. 
They told me, first of all, it happened in Iraq and we cannot investigate the case. I told them that she's a British citizen and as a British citizen, she is being killed. This is a crime for you to investigate. They told me, still, it's a case that Iraqi police has to investigate. I tried to push them and say, you know, it's an honor killing. And I know that if I hear from confident sources that she was killed by her partner, and he is now back in the UK and lives there. They told me honor killing is your culture, and we have to respect it. Otherwise, you will call us racist. It was like a shocking moment for me. And I thought, Sophia was a British citizen. She could speak English very well. She knew if she had a problem where to go, but even if she seek help, would there be any help for her? Of course not, because police told me it's your culture. That's why I thought about establishing an organization to help individual women like Sophia, to raise awareness about honor-based violence and honor killing specifically, and to help individual women to have access to their rights, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> and entitlement in the UK. ICRO, or Iranian and Kurdish Women's Rights Organization, has been born because of Sophia Nader's on a killing case in the UK that up to the date has not been investigated. ICRO became a registered charity in 2002. We providing holistic advice, advocacy, and intensive casework to Middle Eastern women, Afghan women, and North African, so MENA's area or MENA's region, let's say. For women and girls who are at risk of honor-based violence, forced marriage, child marriage, female genital mutilation, domestic violence, and any other form of violence, gender-based violence. We provide counseling and emotional support in Dari, Farsi, Kurdish, Arabic, and English to all women that need help, find emotional help. We set up the first Middle Eastern refuge in the UK in May 2015, just less than a year, to provide a safe shelter and home for women and girls from Middle Eastern. We provide training to professionals to let them uh, have a better understanding of honor-based violence and to, un to be able to identify the sign of honor-based violence we do lots of campaigning to change the law and policy in the UK and around the world. So this is what ICRO is doing. Last year only, we had over 2,500 calls from women or from professionals who sought help for their cases. And we did intensive care with over nearly 800 women in the UK. So it is only ICRO we have done. Imagine the other organization, and police did more work. I was thinking to uh, talk about Bena's case. Ten years ago, a 20-year-old year old Kurdish girl was killed by her father and uncle and many other people involved in her case. She was a victim of female genital mutilation in her childhood. Then, by age 17, she forced into a marriage to a very, very violent and much older man than her. Her family, of course, didn't support her at all. The husband was extremely violent and raped her so many times. Few times she sought the divorce, but her family forced her to return to the husband in spite of all violence. She decided to leave her violent husband and go home. And her male family, uh, by the way, during that period, when she went home to parents' home, she met a man that became in love with her. Her fa male family member made a, co a family court. They decided to kill her and her boyfriend. She contacted police five times, written the name of her own family member, give it to police, and to told them that she is at risk of honor killing, and these people plan to kill her. Still, pe 
police didn't help her properly, and she was killed and gang raped by the same family member that tried to protect the honor of the family. We established a campaign called Justice for Banas campaign and achieved a landmark first extradition of two of the rapists and murderers who fled back to Iraq during the history between Britain and, UK, uh, and Iraq. It was the first extradition of these two people. They returned back to the UK and both of them have received life sentence. The late, it's an ongoing investigation and the less, latest conviction was, which was the seventh person, was in 2013. In all these times, we knew that there is a failure to identify on a base violence cases from different forms of violence and police failed to identify them and especially there is a mixed understanding between on a base violence, on a killing, forced marriage, domestic violence and other form of violence. The issue of cultural relatives, that it's their culture, we have to respect that, or is the community themselves to deal with those issues, was a barrier or a problem in our way. It has been targeted and criticized so many years. It has been changed, but still it works on the ground. ICRO decided to do a research in the UK because there were no any statistics about honor based violence. We didn't know who is the victim of honor or not because it was all written, all the violence commonly written under or recorded under the domestic violence. So we decided to submit freedom of information to all police forces in the UK. And each year since 2010, we repeated that. In five years, we did a last uh, funding or we calculated and analyzed all the research within five years from 2010 to 2014. And we found out that nearly 11,744 cases of honor-based violence only recorded by police in the UK. And we found out even this number it's not the full picture because only one in four, five <coughs> police forces, they, sorry, one in five police forces, they failed to record any cases. So only four police forces in five recorded the cases. And many of them, they only recorded forced marriage or FGM or killing or the cases that ended up in the court. So it didn't show the full picture or the true picture of honor-based violence. And we think that still it's a hidden problem because many women never came to seek help. We lobbied successfully and got lots of media coverage. Uh, we asked them our key recommendation to HMIC <clears throat> in the UK to investigate the honor-based violence cases. I am not going to talk about detail of that because my colleague Rashid is here, she will talk about that. But we helped to design and actively participated in the groundbreaking investigation. I crow one similar investigation to happen by watchdog to every public body in the UK and hopefully around the world. But today I am here to say or establish something quite unique. We, during our 15 years, 13 years experience, find out that we need to have a common understanding and a common law and common approach, European-wide approach to honor-based violence cases. I am hoping that it will be an international, uh, much further than uh, a European one, but in the Europe, definitely we need to have a common law and common uh, approach to tackle on a base violence. I have been in many countries in Europe. I have been in many ministerial case, uh, meetings in the UK, in Sweden, in Denmark, in Norway. And some, in some countries, I have been shocked 
Just last year, it was a ministerial European meeting in Denmark. It has been organized by the Child uh, uh, Protection Office. And I was shocked when their policy is that, that they are doing mediation between the victim and the family. And they are still thinking it's part of the domestic violence. And not only them, but many uh, other organizations, many other government bodies in Europe, they think the same, or they haven't got any you know, deep understanding. This is shocking. It may help, it may not help women. We lose women because of honor based violence, because of misunderstanding. We believe that honor based violence is an international problem. And we have to have a every single European country to have a guideline how to approach those cases. We need to raise understanding across Europe. What is the definition of honor-based violence? Does everyone agree on the definition of honor-based violence that we have? For example, we need to, a starting point can be to learn from each other to understand the good practice and bad practice. In the UK, we have got forced marriage unit. It did a great job, but it's only in the UK. What about other countries? Is it a good example to have in the other countries, in European country? We need to develop a common charter of the good practice if we have Sarah Muhammad as a person that make changes in Sweden. What is the changes? Do we have the same change in other country? How can we learn from each other? Examples of the changes that we need. First of all, common understanding. As I say, we need to have a common definition. Recognition of honor-based violence as a separate form of violence against women and girls, mainly, predominantly. To be part of the panel law, panel code, of all European country. Just uh, my colleague before me, she says that it needs to be aggravated. We are strongly for it, and we need to have honor killing as a form of serious crime to be mentioned by law. And the punishment for pe perpetrators need be, needs to be accordingly. Acknowledgement of mediation as a dangerous form of dealing with honor-based violence cases. Should, this should not be undertaken. We have good reasons for that. Perhaps in the question time we can talk about that. And recognition of the need for some victims or survivors in European to resettle around European countries. There are cases that cannot be saved in the UK. We had cases that we moved them country by country city by city, refuge by refuge, and their family found them. We had to help them to move from UK, for example, to Canada. We had to help them to move from Sweden to Norway, or to help them from UK to come to Sweden. But they faced problem because the social welfare is different in different country. And the women, sometimes they have got children, they are not quickly entitled, straightforward, to the benefit from the other country. She will not receive support from the previous country, the original country. This is a problem for many women. And because of that, we need to help, really, to establish a campaign to have a common understand and common approach around the Europe. So I think this is kind of experience that we had during the way uh, over 13 years of working in the UK and also working with other organizations and other countries like here in Sweden. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. I would like to get back to something that you touched upon in your speech. Um, and it is, of course, the core of, of, the, of, the, whole, of the whole problem, really. Uh, the need to recognize honor-based violence as a specific, separate form of crime. Now, we, we know that this has been met with a lot of difficulty <laughs> on different levels. And um, 
There are, in fact, strong voices in the debate. I will assume this is true of Britain as well, as of Sweden. Uh, strong voices claiming that there is, in fact, no fundamental difference between honor-based violence and gender-based violence in general. And so, according to, to these people, um, to point specifically at honor-based violence is really just stigmatizing minority groups within Western society and enforcing racist attitudes within the criminal justice system. And so this is a recurrent argument uh, of the debate. And I'm just wondering how you would respond briefly to this argument that we seem to be facing all of the time. Uh, you know, for me, uh, I don't see our community as a small community that is stigmatized. I see the whole society. In my opinion, if we don't see the society as a whole, then, yeah, we will be a racist or, you know, be scared of the racist, how they are reacting. So, as a society, we have problem in some part of our society. It's like a neighborhood. We have got a problem in one neighborhood, and we need to take attention, pay attention, more attention to this neighborhood to solve the problem. On a base violence doesn't happen, in fact, in many communities. It happened in some communities. But we are talking about a crime against women. And this crime needs to stop, to be stopped. It doesn't matter if it's happening within Kurdish community or Arab community or Pakistani or Afghan community or Swedish community. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the, it, my, my problem actually is, is not racism. Racism is on our board all the time. We have to deal with that. But fear of racism, it's a bigger problem. Many people say racists will use that. Uh, they will definitely. But for us, we must not sacrifice our women for the fear of racism. We have mm -hmm. human rights, women's rights, and our women's rights are universal. So every single people should be entitled for this universal human rights and women's rights, and safety is part of that. So racist, every day we have to fight racist. Every day we have to fight, fight cultural relatives. Every day we have to fight marginalizing community. And every day we have to fight for women's rights and human rights. I think this is the base of our work. Otherwise, we will step back. Um, now, you mentioned that one of the findings in your research was that police often fails to record cases of honor-based violence as such. Now, why, why is that? Is this due to a lack of understanding, awareness, or are there other factors at play? Mm. Uh, police, of course, uh, lack of resources and many other issues can be there, but I think the main thing for them is, first of all, they didn't pay attention to understand it fully. Uh, still, government uh, has got the policy about multicultural Britain, and which is, I think, being multicultural, is the beauty of any society and any country, but not dealing with people's problem according to their culture. Some part of the culture is wrong, so it should not be respected. I know for, for us, as a person from one of minority community, we have got different celebration, different ceremony, different food, different dance, different writing skills. It's beauty, it's different culture. But when it's come to honor based violence, this is not a culture, it's a crime, and it should be treated as such, and no difference from that. So you so, are saying that cultural relativism is influencing the police force it as is, well? It, yes, so they were a bit scared of that. They were scared of that to be accused of racism. And other wrong policy is that, that uh, the issue of uh, uh, political correctness in the UK, they leave community to deal with their issue by their, uh, their own. For example, in the UK, the race of more than nearly 100 Sharia courts in the UK cause problem for people because many women now will be treated by Sharia courts rather than civil law. And cuts in legal aids, for example, it's another problem, prevent many women, especially women from uh, poorer uh, or low-income families to have access to the law. Efficient, efficiently. So, there, these are problems. Uh, 
government needs to pay attention to tackle this crime from police to education to social services and to any other organization uh, in European countries. Now, uh, <clears throat> your efforts actually contributed to the criminalization of forced marriage in 2014 in the United Kingdom. And I'm wondering if there have been any legal proceedings yet. Has any case actually gone to trial? Because we have the same law now in Sweden, but, but no legal proceedings have been taken yet. So how are you doing yeah. with that? In the UK, we have got uh, also uh, the Civil Act as well. So a woman can have a, uh, has the right to choose between uh, criminal act or civil act. It's sometimes, of course, crime prosecution service, they will take it automatically by themselves. I am not aware of uh, any cases that has been conviction after the criminalization of forced marriage. Before that, actually, we had a few cases, but not after. I am not aware. Maybe Rashid knows uh, some cases. But in my opinion, the criminalization is giving a very strong message to community and to the family, to those people who are forcing a woman into uh, a marriage to tell them, don't force your children into a marriage. Think twice, otherwise you will face justice. And I think this is the strongest message. And another strong message is to girls and women that you have been supported by law. Law is in your sight, so don't be afraid to seek help. And it will bring lots of, uh, of course, education to the community and society. I'm very glad to hear that. Now, um just uh, to, uh, to finish, because we are a bit short of time, but you mentioned in your speech as well that uh, it's important to realize that mediation should not be undertaken. Could you just explain very briefly uh, yeah. to those who might not know, why is that? <clears throat> mediation is a, some, a, some, is a form of, uh, you know, Bringing girls to face the family. In many cases, the women is terrified, first of all, to face family. There is no monitoring that can justify or monitor what happened after a woman or a girl goes back to the family. In our experience, in our country, we have no any law that supporting women. The majority of cases that has been returned to the family, they have been either killed or has been forced into a marriage. One of the cases that a few years ago I was involved, uh, our organization was involved, it was a case of a Kurdish girl. She was only 14. Her family wanted to force her into a marriage. Then the family went, uh, the uh, girl was with social services. Family went to social service and told them that we sign a paper. Of course, we will be a great family. We will not harm her. We will not send her to another country, not forcing her into a marriage. And social services simply believed them. They signed the paper. The same day, they handed over the girl. She was missed. She was missing, has been reported as a missing girl. And the same day, she was sent back to Iraqi Kurdistan, put into a marriage. Another case that police called her family was a case of Tule Goran. She was only 15 when she was killed by her family. We, because she had a boyfriend, her family didn't approve it. She contacted police 12 times with her boyfriend. Last time she went to police in Leytonstown, she backed police to send her to a foster a family, not sending her back to her own family. What police has done, they called her family and said that Tule is with us, she is safe. If you want to come, we can talk about that. And they came over, police had the uh, to lay to her family the same night she was killed. Her body was never found. And after 10 years, her mother in 1999, sorry, 2009, her mother came to court and gave witness. So in our opinion, mediation is extremely dangerous because many people cannot be monitored afterwards. Many people, they will take them to other countries to force them into a marriage or even kill them. It's a quite risky. We therefore never advise any mediation between girls. Safety is important. Save them, protect them, and do the prevention is the best way of saving a girl, provide all the support. We believe strongly, as you say, that on a base violence, on a killing, is about life and death. And many people may have only one chance. So give them this chance.
Thank you so very much for Thank being so here and sharing your experience. <laughs> Diana Navi. Repeatedly in my brain And I could hold you in 